Hi everyone. So today um, I'm going to tell you a lot about how are we working for rural communities. In particular, how do you design for the rural community members and how do you really think like a villager when you work with these people? So again, I'm Charlene and my organization is called Be My H2O Information Network. So to begin with, I would like to tell you about one of the times when I visited a village uh, that was in the rural Gansu region. So this in this particular village, we were uh, going around the households, understanding how their water systems are formed. So we, we, when we went to, uh, went to visit this particular woman on the right, uh, she was showing us the, where do they get the water from. And the majority of their water they get from is from these like old water cellars, more like the ones on the bottom left of the screen. So basically you dig up a cellar, you store water there, uh, and the water is uh, scarce in that region. So you basically have to store it whenever there's rain or whenever water comes and use it for over a month or so. So when she picked up that water from the cellar and boiled it for us, we could still see the water has like really interesting colors and it's like definitely not transparent and it potentially has a lot of different things in it. So when we asked her like, is this the type of water that you would drink on a daily basis? Is, the water that you, is this the water that your family drinks? And what she tells us is that, yeah, this is the water that she's been drinking her whole, her whole life, but this is never something that she would give her kids to drink uh, or give her grandkids. So she says whenever her grandkids come to visit, maybe it's in the summer or in the winter during the holidays or so, he would, uh, he would, she would actually only buy them bottled water to drink or mineral water. She would basically not allow them to drink water from this particular well uh, because she's concerned about the safety of the water. So in that moment, that was a really surprising fact to me because it sounds like for us, something as simple and as daily as water is actually a very luxurious item for them. So basically it's only something that they can afford during the holidays. So, so for something as basic as water for them, it's actually a luxury. And I realized that situation is not alone. It's not just in this village. It's not just in China, it's across the world. Because when I was researching China, I was also doing my research in India. I was doing my graduate research across many of these developing communities and really understanding their water and sanitation system and how it works. And so when I realized that in more and more of these villages, clean water is a luxury, it's an item that's scarce and rare, we start to also think about what, um, what, what can we do? Like even when I was like really far away, still studying in the U.S., visiting India, I was thinking about, is there something I can do on the ground to really make, thing, uh, make things change for these villages? And luckily, I wasn't alone in that thought. I was able to find a bunch of girl geeks, as we call it, like from all different types of backgrounds. Some of them are uh, engineers, and some of them work in data analysis, in GIS, or in all sorts of different fields. And then these are girls from all over the world, and we think that we're all ready uh, to go back home and make a difference for the hometowns that we care about. And that's what, when we started to found my H2O. Uh, it was founded in 2015. It was still when I was in grad school. And at first we just thought, okay, like we went to the villages and we want to do something. We want to help tell the story. So why don't we get more youth to go into these communities? Let just let them just go there and make voices and do the surveys and understand what's happening, right? So in the beginning, that was what we did. We were basically just sending all these young people into the villages to take data, to do the interviews, to write up stories, to publicize them, to make them heard. And that's how we did it in the beginning. So all these villagers were there, uh, all these people were there, they were taking data, they were like testing water and all of that. But there was an issue in that process. When we were taking data from the villagers, they would always ask us like, what are you gonna do with the data? What are you gonna do with these stories? Our water's contaminated, right? Are you gonna do anything about it? Are you gonna provide us with the solutions that we need? Is there something that you're actually going to do for us? And that's something that some our students might not immediately have the answer to. So in that process, it feels like we're almost taking from the villagers. We're taking their stories, we're taking their data, but are we giving anything back? Are we just taking their data? Stories sound interesting, but do we really think about what we can give back to these villagers? What sort of answers, what sort of solutions are we actually giving them? And then that made us think hard. So we started to think about, maybe we need to actually design solutions. Maybe we need to do more than just make voices and tell stories. Maybe we actually need to give these villagers the, the, the answers to the problems that they have. But in that process, we also realized that we might not necessarily have the right skills to be designing these solutions. Because to more effectively design these solutions, you actually, actually need something like more like on the lines of design thinking. You need to know how to think like these villagers. You need to know how to design for them. Otherwise, it's just going to be a disaster, right? 
So at that moment, uh, my, my team and I got together and we thought about, okay, how can we improve on this? How have other people been doing it? So we started to looking at cases in other countries or other rural villages. And we found this interesting, uh, interesting period of time. It's sort of the sanitation campaign period in India. And we thought it was like a great example, not necessarily of success, but of like reiterations and how do you make yourself more successful in terms of designing for rural communities? So we learned a lot. So we started to learn about the sanitation campaign in India. So I'll just like give you a brief overview of why it's important and why it could be used as a point of reference for us. So one thing just at the, on the, on the, in the background of all this, in rural India, there's actually more households that have access to TVs and cell phones compared to toilets. And that's, uh, that's a situation that uh, was very prevalent before and now it might have improved since the sanitation campaign has been happening. So one of the, um, at, at the beginning stage of the sanitation campaign, it's called the total sanitation campaign. It started in the 1990s. It went on to 2012 or so. So during the period of the total sanitation campaign, the government realized that in India, many of the households don't have toilets. They still openly defecate or urinate in the public. They, uh, many of the households don't have really good and sanitary practices. And that's like one of the leading causes for infant mortality and other types of diarrheal diseases that uh, many of these are, are prevalent among many of these villages. So then the government said, okay, they need solutions, right? So we know what they need. They need toilets. So let's just give them toilets. And that's exactly what they did. They basically assigned people to build toilets. They gave a lot of subsidies for people who want to build more toilets. And sort of that's how they push it forward. They just keep building new toilets. But, but then in the end, like something interesting happened, right? It's like kind of on the screen, as you can see, they realized that as they were building these toilets, people are not actually using them as they imagined they would. Actually, over 40% of the toilets built are either abandoned or they've just never been used. They were just put there to get the subsidy. They were just put there because there was like a, maybe like a quota that you need to fulfill, right? But then people weren't using it. And then that's when the, uh, the government all sort of stopped and asked like, what's happening? Why are people not using it? And then they realize the problem is that the awareness level isn't there. We're not designing based on what people need. We're just designing because we think they need it. Because over 70, uh, over, over, sorry, over 47 percent of the people in these villages actually think open defecation is more sanitary and healthy. Because in their mind, you're defecating in a public space, right? It's out in the open. The water will wash it away. That's what's clean. But you're defecating in that like really, really small box. Like, what are you thinking? It's so insanitary. Who's going to clean up everything, right? So in their mind, that's actually less clean. And that's actually something that's unthinkable to them. And they feel like that's something that only the lower caste would do, right? Like, they wouldn't do it. Like, like who would clean that? I wouldn't clean that, right? So, so that sort of mindset is really going on. And so what happens is that even for families who have toys, it's like over 40% of them still are practicing open defecation. And that's a situation as is. And then they realized that when they were designing that solution, that that hardware solution, they weren't thinking about the awareness campaigns that should accompany it, like other things that should be in place. Instead, they just like kind of blindly carried it out. And that's the problem they realized with their first iteration. So, so then they evolved. Right. They realized that, OK, we didn't really understand the community well enough to make change happen. So we need to improve that. So they actually had the 2.0, the total sanitation campaign 2.0, or now they call it the Swash Parat mission. And that was carried out uh, since 2014 up until now. So that's the next iteration of total sanitation campaign. And then in this campaign, you realize that there's a lot more things on the awareness level. They're putting up all these murals, like painting out what should happen, like why is it important to have like sanitary uh, uh, behaviors and sanitary like daily habits. And then um, there's still a, a large number of toilets built every day. But along with these toilets, there's also data system tracking each of the family that have these toilets. People are asked to take pictures in front of their toilets so they feel more connected and knows what they're doing. And every single household has to receive an awareness training. And then when they receive it, there's also data that needs to be taken in that process. So there's a lot more of these campaigns, these monitoring policies that are happening. And even sometimes they go as, for, as far as to do some of these public shaming campaigns, right? So in a village, people maybe they don't care about their health or they don't know about their health but they care about their public reputation so what they do is that when they find someone who's publicly defecating they will like shine flashlights on them they will like blow whistles they would ask everyone to come watch someone who's doing something that's not promoted by the village so they actually put out all these like really interesting policies and weird ways to incentivize um, behavioral change so that's actually what made the made made many of these changes happen so right now there's over 100 toilet coverage but there's also an increase in open defecation free villages. So open defecation free actually means it's not just the toilet coverage, it's actually their practice. It's actually that you don't observe any open defecation. So we see a number of increase in that. And we also see that as another parameter that they look for when they're, uh, when they're kind of evaluating these villages. 
So we kind of see the campaign evolve. Of course, there's still problems with these like public shaming policies and so on, but we see the campaign evolve. We see as it evolves, like people are thinking more about what does the villager want? What is needed for them? How can we motivate them? How can we actually make them go in the direction that's good for their own health, that is good and in the direction that we promote? And so that is what design thinking is. Right. We're trying to avoid designing in a vacuum. We're trying to avoid thinking that, oh, they need a toilet. Let's give them a toilet. And that's it. That's what we're trying to avoid with the design thinking. We're actually trying to think like the, these villagers and really design for them in their place. And so that's generally how the process works. So I'm just going to briefly go through like the theories about design thinking. So you might have like a stronger understanding of what it means. Right. So first, it's generally empathize. Right. You feel what they feel. You know what the challenges are, whether it's sort of um, you know, whether it's sort of you have a disability or just people not having toilets or don't want to go to toilets or they're just like publicly defecating, right? So you understand that. And then you kind of uh, gather that and consolidate at, into a more clear problem statement. And then you start brainstorming. You think about, oh, what are some of the solutions that are possible? Is it toilets? Is it classes, campaigns, classrooms, or so on, right? You think about all the possibilities. And then you start to narrow it down and think about, okay, I'm going to start build prototypes, right? Like maybe it's something like, like you know, a, like a crane or something, right? Like that helps or like a wheels, putting people on wheels like, like in this picture, right? So you start to design something small. You start with like maybe one people, one of your customers, two of your customers, like one of your villages, a couple of your villages. You start with them and see how that works. And then you get that feedback, right? You start testing, you see how it works and you really get the feedback and understand, did it work or not? Maybe, maybe it didn't. Maybe like people after they do public shaming, there's a lot of discrimination, then it means public shaming doesn't work, right? So you implement these new technology, you test them and then you get the response and then you repeat that cycle. So that's generally how this design thinking process is done. You empathize, you do the problem statement, you brainstorm, you prototype, and then you test for it. And then you realize where it failed and then you repeat that process again. So that's generally the theory of design thinking. And through understanding sanitation campaign, we really delved a lot deeper into that. And we start to think about our own model for our organization again. So how can we redesign what we do again? So we realized that one thing that we failed to do before is that we failed to really connect uh, with the communities. We failed to teach our students how to really think like the villagers, how to be a part of them. So we realized, so, so that's kind of the next step that we did. We reshaped our program. We thought about how do we improve the work that we do. Initially, remember, we were just empowering youth to make voices, right? There were nothing talking about what, what are we doing for the rural communities? We're only empowering youth. They can go do the surveys. They can go do all the things that they want to do. But what about the things that we're doing for these communities? So after really consolidating that and understanding the process of designing for the right people and designing in the right way, we also refurbished the way that we talk about our uh, vision and mission, right? So we realized that, yeah, we're doing it still through a collaborative youth network, but we're actually aiming to collect these water data, diagnose the problem with the eventual goal to bring data-driven water resources and solutions to these communities in need to improve their overall health. So with this new statement, it makes it clear that we're hoping to deliver solutions to the communities in need. We're connecting with these communities and we're hoping to improve their overall health. And that's also how our operation systems have changed. So instead of just sending the teams into the communities, we're actually getting these village opinion leaders. Like basically these are people who are in the villages, they know their village already, and they're reporting the problem to us. And then we match them with the student teams, right? So this is an example of a survey app that some of our team use. They'll go in the field, they'll collect data, but then they're collecting data with the support of these VOLs, the village opinion leaders, the village community organizations, right? So they're working directly with these organizations and understanding their problems and using this data collection system to make their problems visualizable on our data platform. And so they basically collect all these data, they make this data viable, and then they make it pop, they, they, they kind of make it pop up on our data platform. And then with when that data is ready, we connect them to the solution providers that we have, like hardware, maybe it's like these water stations, sometimes it's more like educational contents or water purifiers and things like that. So with that information available, we connect the solutions to these community leaders directly so that the community leaders can decide, how am I going to run this solution? How am I going to operate it? How am I going to make it work? And so that's how our system is working now. So we're actually um, uh, kind of leveraging these student networks to help connect the solution to these community leaders so that they can more effectively take place in the community to make these clean water uh, initiatives really happen. So that's kind of how, how we've evolved since, since from in the beginning where we're just sending teams in, right? We started to actually do the solution connection. 
But then the next stage comes another problem is that does the solution hardware actually work? Like, are they really working? And that's another problem we start asking ourselves. And why do we ask these problems? It's because these are the problems the villagers are asking. This was a site where we were landing our water station when we were interviewing the villagers. One thing that they have, it, one, one concern that they always have is that, like, what's the longevity of it? It probably couldn't last more than a few months, right? Like, it's definitely going to be abandoned. That's the general concern or sort of general mindset that we have when we talk with these villagers, because these are things that they're facing on like a daily basis. Like people come here, they give them things and then they go away and then the things are broken. Right. So they realize, like, is this going to work? And so that's also a problem that we face initially. When we landed our first ever solution, we were also just thinking about the hardware. We did like a landing ceremony, we did some educational courses, and we gave the station to the local community. But we realized there was still a lot of problems with it. Like, for example, people that's, people that's living a little further away, they don't really know about the station. And in this January, the water station broke down because the water stopped coming through. They were having a scarcity of water, but they never stopped the motors. The motor got overheated, the motor broke down. But because of the coronavirus, right, the, the, the whole station situation was only fixed again in April. And also we realized that no one has been replacing the filter since its installation because there weren't like a really clear responsibility of who's supposed to do that and what happens if you don't do that. So we realized that a lot of these accompanying rules and policies of how do you run the system isn't in place. Like even if the hardware is in place, the software component of it isn't there. So that's kind of what we realized that we were also not thinking as clearly in our water station 1.0 stage of the work that we do. So we also went on to the 2.0 stage. We start to think more about, apart from just landing the station and landing a purifier that can provide them with the clean water, what about the software? And that's how we did, how we did it. We kind of created this operational contract. So basically we allow this water station to run by self-organized local communities. It's coupled with effective software educational content and the pricing is also decided by the local communities. And whatever profits that's coming from these water stations is actually used to support local infrastructure improvements. And we also started this like common BOT model, which means that we build it, but the local community operates it. And after they've operated successfully for two to three years after our monitoring evaluation, we transfer the ownership to the community after that period. So with that sort of things in place, we signed the contract ahead of time. So the local community organizations know what their rights and responsibilities are, and they take that seriously. So with this in place, we kind of have a really good match of the hardware and the software to make these things happen on a more sustainable basis. So that's kind of how we've been working, how we've been really using design thinking to understand these communities to really make things happen on the ground. And at this point, you might ask like, wow, that all sounds really complicated with so many design and stuff. But can young people really do that? Like, can we participate? We're just college students, right? But what I'm saying is that most of these work are done by college students. These design that we do, you know, these solution landing that we do, these like um, improve the ways that we work our projects that we do, that's kind of the that's kind of the work that most of our volunteers are working with us on. We actually have all these like hundreds of teams on the ground that are doing the work that I've just been mentioning. For example, in one of those, uh, one of the villages in Gansu, uh, when the uh, when the students uh, from Haiyang, like Zhongguo Haiyang, that's like when they went into the villages in Gansu, they saw that students were still directly drinking from tap water that's completely untreated, and they were really concerned for these kids' health. So they actually actively went on the Tencent platform to fundraise for these kids through our uh, organization, and they were able to fundraise like a um, a certain amount, and we were lucky enough to get uh, other. Uh, corporates to, to match that donation funding. So we were able to bring water purifiers into the school and actually redesign their entire water station. So now they have indoor hand washing facilities. So that's kind of the entire process is led by the students. The site is found by the students and they were there to fundraise, they were there to make it happen. And that's exactly what I want to share with you guys is that this whole design thinking process is not that hard. You just have to reiterating, retrying and keep making it happen. And in the past many years, we already have over 100 teams and over hundreds of volunteers that are working with us to, to redesign the process, to reinvent these solutions, to make sure that whatever we give to the communities are more and more tailored to whatever they need. And that's kind of the work that we have already been doing. And that's also the work that we hope more and more students like you guys can join us so that in the future, we can deliver more solutions to these villages across China and make blue more of a possibility for all of these little communities in need. Thank you.